Hi guys. Oops. Found it. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, this should be episode 19. Uh, we're in the Roaring Twenties. We talked about roads the other day. And of course, Model T, Model T, Model T. First in flight, go Dayton, Ohio. Woo, woo! What up, Dayton? North Carolina was not first in flight. We were first in flight. Dayton, Ohio, Wright Brothers, bicycles, Wright Brothers, Dayton, Ohio, first in flight. Human flight became reality in the first decade of the 20th century, quickly launching a number of military and economic applications and propelling early aviators into the stratosphere of fame, the Wright Brothers, Orville and Wilbur Wright. My grandfather's name was Orville Wright because he was born in 1909, just after the plane. So they named him Orville and instead called him Pete because who wants to be named Orville? On December 17th, 1903, Orville and Wilbur Wright flew the first airplane in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. That's because they needed the hills so that they could have it, but they went back to Dayton to make a plane better, which is where they started. The Wrights have flown or they have not flown. They possess a machine or they do not possess one. They are in fact either flyers or liars. It is difficult to fly. It's easy to say we have flown. So there's a big, huge thing about the newspapers and everything like that. And the French didn't believe that the Wright brothers had flown a plane in 1903 because then all the way till 1908, they refused to fly a plane publicly again because they don't want people to come and discover how they've made them fly. And so they won't go publicly and fly a plane until they have a contract to build the planes that they created because they didn't want somebody to steal their ideas until after they had a contract to build these planes. The first flight lasted 12 seconds and went 120 feet. I um, did a hang glider and went about 120 feet. I don't know if it was 20 seconds though, or 12 seconds. It was kind of a long time, but I did it. I hang glided like as long as a football field. <gasps> That's 300 feet. I went as far as a football field. That's 300 feet. Uh, aviation slowly took off uh, as advances were made during World War I. You remember that they used to drop bombs out of the plane? These were called biplanes. Uh, commercial airlines first began operating. 1920s, that's us. Roaring 20s, roaring 20s, roaring 20s. Again, everything was invented before, but once they start really manufacturing them so that uh, normal people or other people can start being able to use them, that's when it really takes off, like with mass production of the Model T. Look at that. Hi, I'm trying not to die by starting this plane. You have to spin the propeller and not get sucked into it. Uh, in 1920, the first transcontinental airmail route established New York City to San Francisco. And there were accidents, and there were accidents, and there were accidents. Flying was dangerous, but safety improved as it got uh, more well-known how to make planes better and safer. And of course, famous, 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 Charles Lindbergh, 1927, made the first transatlantic flight in a spirit of St. Louis from New York City to Paris. Six other men had died attempting the same feat uh, because you have to fly. I think he flies for 33 and a half hours. 33 and a half hours. I can't possibly stay awake for 33 and a half hours if I'm looking at nothing but ocean. I can't do it anyway. But if you're looking at ocean for 33 hours, New York City to Paris, that's across the Atlantic, and you have to stay awake all of that time or you die. He did it. He made a lot of money and he became very, very famous. And as a result, oh, there it is. Somebody kidnapped his baby and then killed him. His baby was kidnapped. They had a reward and for ransom and they killed him. They killed his baby. Lindbergh was a national hero, Lucky Lindy. They used to call him Lucky Lindy. Not after the baby, after the first flight. Uh, Lucky Lindy was a national hero in 1932. Gangsters kidnapped and killed his infant son. I don't think it really was gangsters. I've read up about it a little bit and I don't think that they really know who it was or it was suspect who they decided was the person that did it. Look at that, He's, that's a radio. He's adjusting a radio while he's milking his cow. So the first radios, it was just crazy. That's an antenna trying to get a signal. 
Radio in the 1920s brought entertainment and advertisements into the home, and this shared experience helped create mass culture in America. You have to know the mass culture part. Because of the radios, everybody was listening to the same TV, uh, radio series, like, uh, like you guys watch a radio show from week to week to week. That series that you watched, they had the same thing, but just as a radio program. So they would have a mystery program, and then one week, the next edition, and the next week, the next episode, and then the next episode. So uh, 1920s, everybody had radios. I think by the time that we get to the end of the 1920s, most people in America have a radio. 85%, uh, I would guess, I don't know. Most people. Guglielmo Marconi in 1890 invented wireless telegraphy used in long distance communication in World War I, which is when we're gonna have radio waves. Uh, that's also what the Titanic, that how tele telegraphs happened for the Titanic to try to send messages out that nobody answered. Marconi. And then advertisement, advertisement, advertisement. So you have to know about the 1920s. We have mass spending, mass consumption, People buying cars, people buying radios, vacuums, refrigerators, ovens, washers, dryers, uh, nothing like what you think of when you see in your house, but now we have electricity. Uh, by the end of the 1930s, 1920s, 70% uh, of America has electricity, not rural areas. Way out in the country, no. Cotton Town, probably no. Portland, probably no. But most places near cities or suburbs had electricity. So we have all sorts of radio programs and we have advertising. Uh, when you have mass consumption, you're trying to get people to buy your product. So you also have mass advertising. You have to know that. People bought on credit. You have to know that. Installment plans for, the, for their cars. And so when they couldn't pay them any longer, they would be repossessed. So when the stock market crashed in 1929, everybody lost everything because it was all on credit. Baseball games, sports, boxing, uh, jazz, the famous baseball and boxing were two of the most famous sports at the time. Music, music, jazz, jazz, jazz. Sports uh, thrived with home run hero Babe Ruth and boxer, boxer Jack Dempsey. Uh, my dog's name was Dempsey because when she was a puppy, she died a long time ago, but when she's a puppy, she'd sit on her haunches and she would swing at me like that, and so she looked like a little boxer, so I called her Dempsey. That's why I named my dog Dempsey, because of Jack Dempsey. Oh, I think that's him. He's not a looker. He's not a looker, is he? Okay. A champion is someone who gets up when he can't. Interesting. I can't sing, I can't dance, but I can lick any SOB in the house. Can't tell you what SOB means. It's bad. Radio, radio, radio. Uh, transformed entertainment, politics, business, and created a more united nation because we were all listening to the same thing. It's not like TV today with thousands and thousands of channels 24 hours a day. Everybody had the same radio programs. There wasn't a lot. Everybody was listening to the same thing all across America. So it unified our nation. Hollywood movies, silent movies, 1928, The Jazz Singer, uh, Al Jolson. It's the very first talking movie, and it's actually racist. He's ha acts half of the movie in blackface. So we go to the movies, we have Buster Keaton, Charlie Chaplin, we're gonna see them, they were silent movie stars. The film industry expanded in the 1920s, World War I is over, we are returning to normalcy, we're having, going back to, to being just American and no war. With movie going, Americans spending their extra dollars to be entertained, escape reality, and witness an idealized version of themselves or their country. Made us look better than we actually probably were. Um, in the 1920s, a lot of people went to the theater. There's no TVs, there's no TVs. The very first moving pictures, Thomas Edison invented motion pictures. And then the Great Train Robbery. The Great Train Robbery is the very first uh, movie that has a beginning, a middle, and an end. It uh, became the very first real movie that it actually had a plot. 12 minutes in length, filmed in New Jersey. <laughs> That was actually kind of out in, the, out in the woods, New Jersey. It wasn't very inhabited at that time. And then the birth of a nation, that's the incredibly racist, racist, racist things. It makes sense that it would be the 1920s because uh, the 1920s is historic racism. Remember Woodrow Wilson has kicked out uh, black people from his administration from the White House. Uh, we have, we're gonna have 50,000 KKK members marching in Washington, D.C. Um, D.W. Griffiths, The Birth of a Nation, was the first full-length movie 
That was a long movie and it glorified the KKK of the 1860s and 1870s. You can still see it today, but it is racist. It's, a, it's sad that this is our first full-length movie, but it is. That just tells you what it was like in the 20s. Hollywood, California became the hot spot for movie production due to its favorable climate and landscape. Charlie Chaplin, Douglas Fairbanks, famous, famous. Here he is. Three Musketeers. Rudolph Valentino. Broadway Melody, Best Pictures, All Quiet on the Western Front. Western Front, Trench Warfare. Famous, famous starlet. They used to call them starlets. Actresses, Joan Crawford. She's known for her blue eyes. Propaganda films in World War II boosted the popularity of movies. We had lots and lots of propaganda. Uh, one of the most famous one is uh, Charlie Chaplin plays Hitler in The Great Dictator. Well, he's not theoretically Hitler, but he's the great dictator. Critics argued that film and radio eroded family values. That it was bad, bad, bad. Some movies contain nude female vampires called vamps, shocked public's, uh, public forced codes of censorship on movies that these women were too risque to be seen. So they're called vamps. Movies reflected the idealized self-image of the nation as people, as, just as today, always the most beautiful, always the most handsome actors and actresses. This idealized version of us, or not. Women in the 1920s. Despite their increasing economic role in the First World War, attaining the right to vote, and the flapper image of young urbanites, women were still encouraged to remain contented with the motherly duties of the domestic sphere. Remember, we talked about the cult of domesticity and that women stayed home and even middle class and upper class women had maids and, and servants. And so when they took care of the household, they didn't take care of their kids and clean the house. They took care of the servants who took care of their kids and cleaned the house. So this separate sphere, men were in the business sphere. Women should take care of the home. That's their traditional role, and they should stay to that role. That's in the 1920s. Uh, more Americans lived in cities with its prevailing liberal culture than in the countryside for the first time. So it makes sense that I'm a liberal, that I've spent my life in, in Fort Lauderdale and in Palm Beach in these big urban areas where there are cities and, and this horrific liberal culture. Uh, most people live in cities now. It's faster. It's more amenities. Most women who entered factories in World War I gave up their jobs after the men came home. Rosie the Riveter and other people are not going to give up their jobs uh, like half of the women stay in their jobs after World War II. The Women's Bureau was created after the war to, prom to promote female workers. Uh, suffrage has been accomplished. We've done that. The 19th Amendment granted women suffrage in 1920. The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. The 19th Amendment. Woo! Woo! Way to go, Alice Paul. What a, what a trooper. Despite growing political rights and economic opportunities, women were encouraged to focus on motherhood. They did not want people working in factories. They, didn't want, they wanted men to be in factories, women to be in their homes. In 1921, the Shepherd Towner Maternity Act financed instruction in maternal and infant health care in an attempt to reaffirm the traditional role of women in the household. So, I'm you, 41 years ago. Nope. Yeah, 41 years ago. Um, when I was in high school, I always knew I was going to be a teacher. I always knew I was going to go be a teacher. There were three things that we were theoretically going to be. Teachers or nurses. If we went to college, most women in the late 70s, early 80s like me became nurses or teachers. And then if you didn't go to college, then you became professional secretaries or you worked in department stores. 
That's standard practice for my era of human beings, but it was still a very sexist, female-dominated um, professions that we were shuttled towards. Uh, most, most women didn't go into engineering or mathematics or sales or anything like that. It was still a man's world. And that's in the 70s, in the late 70s, early 80s. I had to take home ec. I wasn't allowed to take wood shop. I wasn't allowed to take auto mechanics. I wasn't allowed to take welding. I had to take home ec. I had to learn to sew and cook. I still can't cook. Still can't cook. Margaret Sanger led the birth control movement. Critics argued it promoted sexual promiscuity. Margaret Sanger, birth control. Margaret Sanger, birth control. Birth control. Please send me one of your papers on birth control. I have seven children and cannot afford any more. We hold that children should be one, conceived in love, two, born of the mother's conscious desire, and three, only begotten under conditions which re render possible the heritage of health. Therefore, we hold that every woman must possess the power and freedom to prevent contraception, except when these conditions can, can be satisfied. So they wanted to be able to have birth control. Uh, so they wouldn't be weighted down by unwanted babies, that they didn't have a choice. No self-respecting woman should wish or work for the success of a party that ignores her. 1872. Uh, in 1923, the National Women's Party began to campaign for the Equal Rights Amendment. It's another 50 years for the Equal Rights Amendment. Some of them, it's still not passed in some, some states. It is not passed, passed nationally in the United States of America yet. Still has not been passed. Smoking, 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 smoking. This is a flapper. Look what she's wearing. Bob haircut, bright red lipstick, uh, strings, string straps. Flappers dress provocatively, dance to Charleston, and listen to jazz, and often smoke cigarettes. Conservatives criticize these women as vamps, especially people from rural areas of the country where it's very, very conservative, very, very religious. This is all this, the words that they used in the 1920s. The cat's pajamas. They were the cat's budget pajamas. That's where we get baloney. Oh, that's baloney. Hooch, illegal liquor. And then jazz, 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 music of the flappers. Uh, that is an authentically American thing, and it is authentically from African American traditions, from ragtime, from soul, from Negro spirituals, is where jazz derives. It is from African Americans. By the way, the first rock stars are also black. They are not white, it's not Elvis. Elvis is the first white guy to become a rock star. That's why he's known as being the king of rock. However, he was far from being the first rock star. That was, of course, a black guy. Sachimo, Louis Armstrong, trumpet, trumpet, trumpet. Oh, did I miss Duke Ellington? Duke Ellington, famous, famous, famous. Okay, literary achievements of the 1920s, the lost generation. They claim lost generation of American authors used their international fame and literary talents to criticize the conformity, materialism, 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 and mass consumerism of the 1920s. People are also like that now. People are also now anti-materialism, anti-consumerism, knowing that it just gets you in this horrific burden of debt. Uh, but they are called the lost generation. Uh, lost because many of them didn't survive World War I, and lost because they're lost. Nothing is the same as it ever was. Great Gatsby, which spoke to the excesses of money and alcohol, by the way. First you take a drink, then the drink takes a drink, then the drink takes you. Ernest Hemingway. There's a lot, a lot of quotes. Ernest Hemingway ends up killing himself. So does his daughter. A lot of Hemingways killed themselves. Happiness in intelligent people is the rarest thing I know. Famous, famous quote. I know war as few other men now living know it, and nothing to me is more revolting. I have long advocated its complete abolition. 
as its very destructiveness on both friend and foe has rendered it useless as a method of settling international disputes. And we go on to have a World War II and a Korean War and a Vietnamese War, <coughs> Afghanistan, Iraq, and many, many, many other wars. I love sleep. My life has the tendency to fa fall apart when I'm awake. Sinclair Lewis uh, makes fun of small town America. In America, most of us, not readers alone, but even writers, are still afraid of any literature which is not a glorification of everything American, a glorification of our faults as well as, as, well as our virtues. America is the most contradictory, the most depressing, the most stirring of any land in the world today. Our American professors like their literature clear and cold and pure and very dead. William Faulkner, Soldiers Pay, The Sound and the Fury, and As I Lay Dying. He's very famous, and boy, is he hard to read. Big, big words, big words constantly, all sorts of big words all of the time. I remember when I taught English, uh, like my second year of teaching or something like that, I was reading a story by Faulkner, and in the first two paragraphs, I, the teacher, had to look up like eight words in just two paragraphs. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm so in trouble. The whole story was like that. I mean, it's brilliant, but you have to be brilliant to understand him. It's a shame that the only thing a man can do for eight hours a day is work. He can't eat for eight hours. He can't drink for eight hours. He can't make love for eight hours. The only thing a man can do for eight hours is work. And the Harlem Renaissance, that is the only poetry that I liked teaching when I was an English teacher. I love teaching the poetry of the Harlem Renaissance. It's protest poetry. It's people that are standing up for their rights. During the Harlem Renaissance, black pride led to increased role of blacks in shaping American culture. You saw it on the video. You have to know it's, they refer to themselves as the new Negro. The new Negro. Not being afraid. Harlem is a symbol of liberty and the promised land to Negroes everywhere. Langston Hughes and County Cullen were among the greatest poets of, Har of the Harlem Renaissance. Langston Hughes is my favorite poet. Wall Street's big bull market. I have this here. I have it here. Now there's a girl in front of it. The sustained bull market of the Roaring Twenties. Bull is good. Bear is bad. A bear market is bad. A bull market is good. The sustained bull market of the Roaring Twenties. Remember, it's pro-business. We have Harding, Coolidge, Hoover. Everything business, everything to help businesses. Uh, led to over-speculation in the real estate and stock markets. And as credit, you have to know about credit, 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 and installment. Soared past income, the nation set itself up for the most de disastrous deleveraging in its history. That means that they had so much money owed on debt that they had to pay in the future, that they had so many things that they bought on credit that they couldn't afford to pay for them. So when that stock market crashed, everybody lost everything. All because of credit, credit, credit. It's still that but way today. People that have way too much credit are just destroying themselves with interest, uh, including our country, our finances as a country. Uh, that's called the deficit. Many ordinary Americans invested in the stock market in the 20s, hoping to take advantage of the sustained bull market called over-speculation. They would put money in that they didn't even have. They would borrow money to put money in the stock market. And as a result, when the stock market crashed, they couldn't pay that money back. So you have to know it's called speculation. Over-speculation is too much of it. And, um, and it's one of the reasons we crash in 1929. This is the first housing bubble in American history. The bubble burst in 1926. That's in Florida. I'll sell you some swamp land in Florida. Florida home properties were a hot commodity until the great Miami hurricane of 1926. My grandparents, the ones that were plumbers, I told you that they had land in, in Florida. They had land on Miami Beach, on Miami Beach. Now, in, in, indeed, it was all like trees and trees and trees and mosquitoes and mosquitoes everywhere. So it wasn't very, it wasn't this, it wasn't this. So when this hurricane, this other stuff that was considered swampland, everybody sold their land. If I still had that land that they had, I would have been a cabillionaire and I probably wouldn't be a teacher right now. But I'm not a cabillionaire, and I am a teacher. Despite property, banks often failed in the 1920s due to over-lending. You have to know a lot of bank failures, lots of bank failures. And there's nothing to prevent you losing your entire savings from those banks. 
the Federal Deposit Insurance Corps is going to be uh, part of the New Deal program. It's one of the first things that Teddy does, and he guarantees your deposits. But before that time, all of the money that you had at the bank, if the bank failed and you had $2,000 in there, gone. Now keep in mind, this is in the 1920s, in the 1930s. In the 1920s, my house, the house that I bought in 1992 for $60,000, was built in 19, I mean, I bought it in 1992. It was built in 1962 for $13,000. And so back in the 20s, uh, 40 years before that, they were probably a couple thousand dollars to buy a house. And so people lost everything. A couple thousand dollars then is a lot of money. Remember, $5 a day was enormous pay to work in, in the, uh, the factories, in the Ford factories. Secretary of the Treasury Andrew Mellon reduced taxes on the rich, thrusting the burden on the middle class. It is the beginning of trickle down in economics that is going to become most famous under Ronald Reagan. Tax cuts for the rich today also huge, huge tax cuts for the rich. Some of the top 16 or something like that corporations in America pay no taxes. Tax cuts for the rich. It's 20s. It's a Republican uh, government, Republican presidents. Give tax breaks to large corporations so that money can trickle down to the general public in the form of extra jobs. Doesn't work that way. He also uh, reduced the national debt indirectly, encouraging a bull market. Cut the top income tax rate from 77 to 24. Cut taxes on low income from 4 to 0.5. Reduce the federal estate tax and be more efficient in government. That's famous, those tax plans. This is what happens with Reagan. The top one is what happens with Reagan. It doesn't happen now. The prosperity of the 1920s set up the crash and poverty of the Great Depression in the 1930s. Hardy, Coolidge, Hoover. 1920s. And I'll talk to you again soon. Bye.